Okay, welcome everyone to um, the ZAG seminar, December 17, 2020. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Andrew Harder from Lehigh University, who's gonna speak on log symplectic pairs and mixed Hodge structures. Well, thank you to the organizers for, um, for letting me speak. And I'd also like to thank all of the uh, audience participants for coming. It's you know, a pleasure to speak uh, here, I suppose. Um, yeah, so as Chuck said, I'm going to talk about log symplectic pairs and mixed Hodge structures. So this is based off several, you know, different things that I've done in the past couple of years. So um, yeah, I'll get started. So first, I mean, let's, you know, answer the question, what is a log symplectic pair? So for me, this is going to be the following uh, data. So I'm going to take a smooth projective variety. So I mean, so for me, everything's going to happen over the complex numbers today. So I'll take a smooth projective variety. Uh, this is going to be something whose dimension is even. So maybe I'll say the dimension of X is 2D. So anytime you talk about symplectic things, dimensions tend to be even. D is going to be a simple number crossings divisor inside of X. So this is something I'll mention a little bit later. And then I'll have omega, a non-degenerate holomorphic two form or on X with log poles on the divisor D. Okay. Um, all right, so this is, this is the data that I'm, I'm going to talk about. So this non-degeneracy condition, this should be interpreted as follows. So you can think about this as saying that if I take the, so D is the dimension, if I take the top wedge power of omega, so this is now going to be a section of the top power of the logarithmic cotangent bundle. So this is a non-vanishing section. Okay, so that's this non-degeneracy condition. You can also think about this as, you know, how it behaves on uh, maps between uh, different, different vector bundles, but this is probably the easiest way to understand this. Okay, so I should make a couple comments. So I've assumed that my uh, divisor is SNC, but this is not super common in the world of log symplectic geometry. So SNC is a, is a strong condition. It's not necessarily something that people tend to assume, but for me, it's going to be nice because it gives me a nice bridge between uh, the geometry of the divisor and Hodge theory, which is you know, the topic of the talk. So we assume this. Uh, because of Hodge theory. Okay. Um, so secondly, I want to mention that as we have this form, this top wedge power, um, this implies that the pair XD is actually log calabia. So log symplectic implies log calabia. And that's essentially by definition. So this form, this top wedge power being non-vanishing means that there that the um, logarithmic uh, uh, that the anti-canonical bundle oh, that D is a section of the anti-canonical bundle. Therefore, this is a log Clavio pair. Okay, so right. So this is this is this is straightforward. So there's a bunch of trivial examples of log symplectic pairs. Let's give a couple right now. So the first sort of trivial example that I'll talk about is holomorphic symplectic varieties. So if D is the empty divisor, then omega is just an element in the, uh, the cotangent bundle. So the, the second wedge power of the cotangent bundle and non-degeneracy just says that this is, um, X is homomorphic symplectic, right? So a non-degenerate form of this type is just called a homomorphic symplectic. Okay, so that's our first sort of trivial example. The second trivial example is uh, what we get in dimension two. So in dimension two, um, what's a log symplectic pair? So this is just going to be a pair consisting of a surface, S, a surface. And D just needs to be any SNC, simple normal crossings, uh, anti-canonical divisor. Therefore, in dimension two, log Clabiau is equivalent to log symplectic. Okay. 
Okay. okay. So these are our basic examples. Now I'll maybe mention a couple more uh, more complicated examples. So first of all, there's this example or class of examples coming from work of Fagan and Odesky, and I should probably mention a couple other authors in conjunction with this. So I'll mention that this has been studied by people like Gualtieri and Pym, maybe more precisely just Pym. And there's also related work by people like Polishuk on this. Um, okay, so how is this example constructed? Well, first of all, I take an elliptic curve E. So then I take a, a, an embedding, so a degree five map from E to P4. So this is an embedding. And the image has degree five. So once I have this embedded uh, subvariety, I can take its uh, secant variety. So that's the uh, closure of the union of all lines passing through pairs of points inside of the image. So the secant variety. Of E. Okay, so now that I have this data, so the secant variety is a degree five hypersurface inside of P4. However, um, this is a, uh, well, this is, this is, this is unaruled. Therefore, um, or it's a ruled, uh, anyway, so this, this, this is not a gen generic degree five hypersurface. This is um, something that has a, a whole bunch of singularities. And in fact, the singular locus of this example lie, is, is isomorphic to the symmetric square of the elliptic curve that you started with. So this is the singular locus of uh, the secant variety. So up to this point, what we have is P4 and a divisor inside of that. So we have P4 and a divisor in it. So this forms a log symplectic pair if you don't worry about the simple normal crossings condition that I'm imposing. However, if you do try to impose that, this is no longer a simple normal crossings um, pair since this, this, this um, secant variety is not, this is just a singular hypersurface. So what you can do is you can blow up P4 along the symmetric square. So this is a blow up over P4. And what you can do from that is to construct something of the type that I want. So this DE here, so this is the uh, proper transform, or sorry, this is the pre-image. This is just the pre-image of the secant variety. So this will now consist of two different divisors, the exceptional divisor of the blow up and the proper transform of the secant variety. And I can take the pair consisting of this, this, this blow up plus the uh, pre-image of the divisor DE, and this forms a log symplectic pair. Okay. Right, so um, this is one of my more basic examples. And the reason I like this one is because it's not something that seems obvious to me to have come from surfaces, right? So most of the example, I mean, so anytime you have a log symplectic pair or a pair of log symplectic pairs, you can take, uh, you can, you can take Cartesian products and you can produce a new log symplectic pair. So this is not something that comes from taking products of surfaces in an obvious way to me. Okay, so that's one of the more basic examples Maybe an even more basic example is a, you know, a, a toric variety. So if I take a fan sigma inside of a lattice M, then, um, well, I'm going to have an even dimensional lattice because I want something even dimensional in the end. And let's also assume that sigma is uh, simplicial in a strong sense, not just that it's uh, faces are simplices, but th this is actually going to give me that the the um, the cones are simplices that this is going to give me a smooth toric variety. So then x sigma, this is the toric variety associated to sigma. And this is now a smooth toric variety. By the conditions that I'm imposing on the fan sigma. I'll let D sigma be the torque boundary divisor. And 
In other words, this is the union of all torus invariant divisors. Since I've chosen this to be sort of a nice fan, this is now a simple number crossings divisor in my toric variety. And then I'll let alpha be something of the following form. So this is going to be a, well, this is going to be a holomorphic form on the big torus inside of the toric variety. So I have C star to the 2D living inside of this toric variety. Then I can take the following type of homomorphic two form on the big torus, and this will extend to a homomorphic form or a logarithmic form on the entire toric variety with uh, log poles on the boundary. So I can choose such a form uh, in this way, oops, and I'll just make this assumption that this, uh, the, this, this is a non-degenerate two form. So I can assume this in some sort of, some sort of Nice way. So these are elements, in, these, are, these are inside of C. And let's assume that this is non-degenerate. Then the pair, X sigma, D sigma, uh, and maybe I'll include the no alpha in the not notation here because in some sense, this whole concept uh, includes the concept of the form. So this is log symplectic. Okay, so this is another sort of basic class of examples. Okay, so after we have this, we can now start to construct an, more examples from these types of examples, and I'll explain this process. Um, um, uh, uh, by blowing up uh, symplectic leaves inside of these toric varieties. Oh, Andrew, you have a, a question from uh, Yuji Odaka. Uh, does Figum okay. the example appear in some degenerating compact hyperkähler? I don't know. I'd love to know the answer to that. I don't know, though. Um, I see. I, I, yeah, I, I would love to know the answer to that. That's, this is, Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Yes. This is part of where I'm going. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, let's see. So, right, so I can construct new examples by blowing up symplectic leaves. So having this log symplectic structure, uh, gives me actually a Poisson structure on X. So the, the big manifold inside of which everything lives. And so I can think about the symplectic leaves of that Poisson structure. Generally speaking, these aren't necessarily super easy to find, but in the toric case that I've been talking about, you can actually find these symplectic leaves in a very combinatorial way. And this is maybe something I should uh, attribute to people like Hacking and Kiel, or this is, I learned this from Hacking and Kiel. Okay, so how do I talk about the symplectic leaves? So if I give, if I choose the data of a ray inside my fan, so this is a ray, or maybe just a ray generator. Then to this ray, I can associate a toric boundary divisor. So this is a toric divisor. So this is a torus invariant divisor inside of X uh, sigma. And then to alpha, I, oh, I can think of alpha as being an element inside of the second wedge power of the dual to our lattice M. So N is uh, the dual this, and in fact, Maybe I should properly be putting complex coefficients here. Uh, however, I can think about this thing integrally and that'll make my life easier. So really in this case, I'll be thinking about integral forms. Um, okay, so this is an element inside of here. Then to that, I can actually attach an element inside of the lattice N. So that's just the element alpha N given by uh, the, the, the map, uh, obtained by composing with these two things. So this is from M to, in this case, Z. And this is in fact going to be orthogonal to N, right? Because this is an alternating pairing. Therefore, uh, this is inside of the orthogonal complement of N. <clears throat> so the orthogonal complement of N, of eta, I suppose, is the uh, lattice in which the fan determining D eta uh, lives. Therefore, I can think about this as providing me a regular function on 
on the torus, which I'll call maybe T eta inside of D eta. So anytime I have an element in this lattice or the dual lattice, I get um, I get a regular function, a monomial on the the the, the underlying um, torus. And so what I can do is I can just take this um, take this regular function and I can look at its closure, uh, the closure in fact of of a fiber of this function here inside of the toric variety. So these are the symplectic leaves. or these are some symplectic leaves of this Poisson structure. So the proposition, which was, I guess, stated by Hacking and Cure, this is why I first saw it stated. So to be honest, they, I mean, they don't, they don't prove it. Um, they leave it as an exercise uh, because it is quite easy, um, is that if I blow up along these symplectic leaves and I take the pair consisting of the blow up Plus, now in this case, I'm going to let this be the, um, this is just going to be the proper transform of the torque boundary. Of the sigma, then this is a log symplectic pair. And so if you want to think about what the form is, it's just the pullback of the original form alpha. So this is a, another construction. And so, as I said, this construction can be extended anytime you know the symplectic leaves or codimension one symplectic leaves inside of the boundary of your log symplectic pair. Okay, so more generally, what you can do is you can just take a collection of all such pieces of data. So if you choose a collection of, of ray generators and you assume that they satisfy some sort of combinatorial transversality condition or just transversality, but that's something that can be de detected combinatorially. So the transversality just means they intersect nicely in the boundary. I mean, that's nice. And when I say combinatorial, I mean that there's a way to detect this given the combinatorics of the fan and the chosen ray generators. In. So there's some sort of way to, to codify all this. Um, then you can construct a log symplectic pair, which I'll denote as follows. So x sigma, I'll put n in here and I'll put alpha in here because it depends on all this data. So this is just the sequential blow up as in the previous uh, case. Right? So I have this, this log symplectic pair. Associated to this data. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> right, so um, great. So I mean, these are things that I'll give the name, I, I don't know, this is sort of a provisional name, but I'll call it something like a toric cluster variety. Um, this maybe is a bad name, but this is just some sort of way for me to, me to denote this class of varieties. So why would I call it a cluster variety? Well, one reason for saying that is that these, um, this class of varieties includes the class of acyclic cluster varieties. So if, if you take the fan sigma to be the uh, standard uh, simplex, uh, so that is just the, uh, the 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 well the fan whose rays are the uh, unit um, uh, basis vectors. Um, or generated by unit basis vectors, uh, so the first, you know, uh, orthent of the of the space. Um, then the corresponding torque variety is just uh, c to the two d in the case that I'm thinking about. So this this doesn't need to be there in general, but anyway. Um, and if you take alpha to be the uh, 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 sorry um, to be to be basically a two form. associated to an acyclic quiver, uh, we get a class or a, cl a, a subset of things that are uh, called acyclic cluster varieties. I should also mention that um, 
another class of varieties that you get this way is some subset of the class of multiplicative hypertoric varieties as well. So these are just, I mean, I'm not going to explain what they are. These are varieties associated to hyperplane arrangements. Um, you know, I thought for a long time that actually we could get all multiplicative hypertoric varieties this way, but I don't think that's true. However, all multiplicative hypertoric varieties are going to be covered by things of this form. So there's, there's something there. Okay, so this is you know, maybe one reason uh, that you should care about these things is that they, you know, give us another way to think about possibly uh, different varieties that people have run into in the past. But if you're sort of interested in not just non-compact things, why should you think about log symplectic pairs? Well, you can think about these in the context of degenerations of holomorphic symplectic or hyperkähler varieties. So I'm going to take the data of a semi-stable degeneration. So this means that x is going to be smooth for me. Um, delta is the unit disk. And all fibers away from zero are going to be smooth. The fiber over zero is going to be simple normal crossings. And um, there's going to be multiplicity one for each component of this fiber. So I'm going to choose sigma to be a relative, in this case, so this is now a relative logarithmic two form uh, with poles at the fiber over zero. So I should maybe emphasize that. So this is the pre-image of zero. And sigma is going to have this non-degeneracy condition as before. So essentially, I'm just going to say that the, uh, the highest possible wedge power of this is non-vanishing. So uh, in fact, yeah. So again, I'm sort of assuming in all of this that the dimension of x0 is even, or that the relative dimension of the map is even. Okay, so this is this is called a good degeneration. So this term was coined by Nagai. Okay, so one thing that I should mention is that if I have a good degeneration and I look at the smooth fibers of this good degeneration, then these smooth fibers are going to be homomorphic symplectic. So smooth fibers. are holomorphic symplectic. So it's natural to ask what happens to the singular fibers of a good degeneration. So if I take the following data <clears throat> consisting of a good degeneration and I let X be a component of the central fiber of the singular fiber and I'll let D be X intersected with the singular locus of X zero. Right, so this is the, the place where it intersects other components of the singular fiber. Then the pair consisting of X and D is log symplectic. So this is not a hard thing to prove. <clears throat> so the proof that I know goes the following way. So what I do is I take the symplectic form here and I take its wedge product with d log pi. So sigma starts off as a relative two form with log poles on x zero. But when I take the wedge product with d log pi, this actually gives me a well-defined uh, non-relative three form. This is in h zero of still with log poles. Okay, now I can take the residue of this form at the component X, so D log pi. And this is going to give me a, just a, a, a form, a two form with log poles. And then you can check locally that this is going to be non-degenerate. So check non-degeneracy. Right. 
And so that's essentially how this goes. It's a local check. You know, one thing that maybe you should, uh, I don't know, consider after seeing this slide is that this now, you know, says that if I want to study hypercalar varieties or uh, homomorphic symplectic varieties, maybe it's nice for me to start by studying log symplectic pairs and try to construct degenerate homomorphic uh, symplectic varieties and smooth out. So this is, I mean, this is a question that one can ask. Um, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, I think there's work on the actual smoothing of these degenerate versions, but I don't think anyone's actually really succeeded in producing anything this way. But this is a question that one could uh, think about. Okay, so that's my basic um, uh, remarks about this. However, I mean, generally speaking, we're more interested in hypercalar varieties than just holomorphic symplectic varieties. So you can ask what happens specifically when you start with a hypercalar variety, not a holomorphic symplectic variety. So what if the fibers, so XT, so a smooth fiber is hypercalar and not just holomorphic symplectic. So what, are there any special things that are satisfied um, by the components of the singular fiber in this case? So before moving on, I wanna mention some work about degenerations of hypercalar varieties that there's actually sort of nice classification results. And these are, well, I mean, there's more than just this, but I'll just mention work of Kalar, Lazo, Saka, and Voisin. So I'm gonna let N2 be the log of monodromy, so T2, where T2 is the monodromy. So assume, of course, I'm going to assume that I have a degeneration. Uh, and in this case, you, you can uh, weaken the conditions that I made before. This doesn't need to be a semi-stable degeneration. Uh, this needs to be, I think, um, DLT, and it needs to be essentially relatively minimal. But this is a, a much sort of weaker geometric starting point than what I had. Uh, or sorry, st stronger, weaker. I guess uh, they have fewer restrictions. Um, okay, so given such a thing, you can look at the monodromy map on cohomology. So this is just, oops, uh, xt to xt. In this case, maybe we're assuming that this is going to be a unipotent operator, but that can always be arranged by base change. So we're going to assume it's unipotent, then we take its log. And then there's a close relationship between the behavior of this monodromy operator and the geometry of the central fiber of the degeneration. So this is what's um, well, one of the things that uh, Kolar, Laza, Saka, and Voisin do. So if N2 is zero, then after base change, uh, we, can, we, can, we can find a smooth central fiber. So base change and maybe some birational modifications. Um, if N2 is not zero, but its square is zero, oops, then the dimension of, and I'll use the notation gamma for the dual intersection complex of some divisor, this is equal to the dimension of X zero, so the complex dimension divided by two. And in the type three case, that is where the order of no potency is uh, two. Oops. Uh, right, so where n two squared is uh, is not zero, but n three squared uh, n two cubed is equal to zero, then the dimension of the dual intersection complex is equal to the um, dimension of the central fiber, and you can say more in this case actually that the there are certainly um, some types of uh, geometric statements that one can make about the structure of this the central fiber. You know, it's, it's uh, I think it's a Q um, uh, CPN or something like this. Okay, so that's basically the idea. You can get some sort of geometric uh, geometric sense uh, of the central fiber just starting from the uh, monodromy action on H two. So this is sort of nice information. Um, okay, so this is where we start. Now I want to say some stuff about, you know, um, 
what, what are the consequences of having a, uh, one of these types of degenerations of hypercalar varieties for, um, for the components? And in order to say that, I wanna say a little bit about mixed Hodge structures. Uh, is there a question? I have a question about type one. Yeah. The central fiber is actually smooth because uh, mm. even for K3, I think that you can achieve it, but uh, if you use algebraic spaces, May have some mild singularity. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I'm I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. In the K three case, you can do this after. Um, I, I I I I think you can do it after base change. You might not have an algebraic space anymore, but yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is that answering the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Sorry, sorry if that wasn't a good answer. Um, right. Um, okay, so yeah, so I want to make some statements about mixed Hodge structures and the consequences of all of this for the components of the degeneration. So I'll just give you a very basic rundown of what the data of a mixed Hodge structure is composed of. So um, this is composed of three things. So a rational vector space, V, so rational. You can play with coefficients, but I'm just going to stick with rational for today. So there's an increasing weight filtration on V. And this is, and then there's a decreasing Hodge filtration, but this is no longer on V. It's on the tensor product of V with the complex numbers. You see? And this just needs to satisfy the condition that the uh, that if I take the induced filtration on the weight graded pieces, this is a uh, induced filtration gives a oops oh my goodness okay this is a pure Hodge structure. of weight i, okay? And given a mixed Hodge structure, there's a decomposition defined by Deline into these IPQ spaces. So these are basically spaces which are analogous to the HPQs when you have a pure Hodge structure. It's not quite so strict and well-defined, but there's, there is this analogy and it has this nice property that the dimensions of these IPQ spaces recover the dimensions of the Hodge graded pieces of the, um, of the weight spaces. In fact, I, I, there's an error here. There should be a weight graded piece. Okay, so there's, there's this nice decomposition. And what I now want to do is give a definition of, of sort of a special type of log symplectic pair. So I'm going to say that a log symplectic pair, and maybe I should include in my notation the homomorphic two form sigma or the log form sigma is called uh, of pure weight W. You say this is of pure weight W if, so the class sigma gives me a, a well, it gives me a two form on the complement of D. So it gives me a class in the Durham cohomology of the complement of D. So sigma in H2. Right. So let's see. So H2 of any or HN of any cohomology, uh, oh, sorry, of any uh, quasi projective variety. Um, comes with the canonical mixed Hodge structure. So I can ask where the sigma lives. So if this is inside of, is in I to W, um, then I say that this is a log symplectic pair of pure weight. Right, so there are three different places where this sigma could live, or it lives in the direct sum of these three spaces. So more generally, sigma lives inside of a class of sigma. Is inside of the sum of I to zero 
i to one and i to two. So when I'm saying that it's a pure weight, I mean that it actually sits in one specific component here. It, it doesn't mix uh, components. So this also tells you that there's three different possible pure weights, um, sort of in, in the same vein as the, um, you know, this Collar Liza Sac of Voisin uh, classification, there were three different possible types of degenerations. We now have three possible pure weights. Um, okay, so what are the examples of this? Well, every example that I showed um, from before has pure weight. And I'm being a bit sloppy. I'm not really telling you which symplectic form I'm choosing in all these cases. And that's because, as we'll see in a second, the actual pure weight doesn't depend on the choice of symplectic form. There are some non-examples too. So it's not all log symplectic pairs, which are pure weight. So for instance, if I take S to be a K3, I take, uh, well, maybe S1, S2, S and D to be a rational surface then the pair that you get by taking the product is not of pure weight for any log symplectic form you choose. Okay, and so this is all leading up to the following uh, statement. So if I take a good degeneration so that the smooth fibers are hypercalar. And I take the pair XD from before. So this is a component of the singular fiber over zero and its intersection with all the other uh, components of the singular fiber. And I take the corresponding two form that we got before, then this is log symplectic of pure weight. Let's see, so, so this is that. So you can ask several questions about, you know, in analogy with things that we know about the degenerations of hypercalar varieties, we can ask, you know, is there sort of a nice description of the geometry of log symplectic pairs of pure weight? And I didn't mention anything about the cohomology of degenerations of hypercalar varieties, but there are similar things known due to work of people like Soltetenkov about the, the cohomology of, or limit mixed Hodge structures associated to um, degenerations of hypercalar varieties. So in terms of geometry, what can you say? Well, you can give a nice correlation in the same way that you talked about the, um, well, in the same that way that I talked about this collar lazasaka voisin classification, you can give a nice description of how pure weight corresponds to geometry. So you can see that if my log symplectic pair has pure weight zero, then the torque, then the boundary divisor is empty if the log symplectic uh, uh, form, if, if I have a log symplectic pair whose log symplectic form is of pure weight one, then the dimension of the dual intersection complex of D is equal to the dimension of X over two minus one. And in the pure weight two case, you see that the dimension of the dual intersection complex is um, so the dimension of um, x minus one. So you have this shift by one here. This also tells you that it doesn't depend on which log symplectic, the, the, the pure weight of, of a log symplectic form is sort of an intrinsic property of a pair. You can't have log symplectic forms of two different pure weights on the same pair because that would contradict this table above this, this dimension. So this is an intrinsic thing. And finally, you can see that if, um, well, this, this recovers by combining with the previous result, so it recovers a KLSV classifi classification. If, well, this under this very weak condition that you have a good degeneration, which is much weaker than uh, the collar les a sac of voisin um, starting point.
Okay, so this is what I have to say about the geometry of such things. Um, now I'll make some comments about the cohomology. Okay, so first I want to set things up a little bit. I'm going to first focus on the case of pure weight two. And these are sort of the, so if you go back to the examples that I had before, the um, fagan odesky example, this, this, is, this gives a log symplectic pair and it's a log symplectic pair of pure weight one. So this is not something that will be affected or considered in this discussion. Uh, but the log symplectic pairs coming from toric varieties. So these toric cluster varieties that I mentioned these are log symplectic pairs of pure weight two. So this, these are examples that will be sort of affected by the discussion uh, below. So the first thing that I want to introduce is this Hodge-Tate condition. So when I say a, a mixed Hodge structure is Hodge-Tate, that means that the IPQs are equal to zero unless P is equal to Q. And this implies that the weight graded pieces in odd degree are zero. And if I take the weight graded pieces in even degree, these are all concentrated in the center. Right? So think maybe the cohomology of Pn or something. This is going to be Hodge Tate. So this is a simplicity condition on sort of the structure or the, the way a mixed Hodge structure is made up, uh, is, is, is put together. So the proposition, which is maybe a bit more than a proposition, is that if xd is log symplectic of pure weight 2, then the cohomology ring, so that is, if I take any cohomology group of the complement of d and x, is Hodge Tate. So this is just this very strong simplicity condition, which is um, imposed by the fact that your symplectic form lives in a specific IPQ. So this can be compared to work of Soldatenkov for degenerations. So Soldatenkov showed that if you have a type three degeneration of hypercalar varieties, then the limit mixed Hodge structure is going to be Hodge Tate. Um, I mean, you can also say things about how the Hodge filtration works for any log symplectic pair. So the second proposition here, so this one here, is that if XD is a log symplectic pair, and this is no condition uh, on weights or anything like this, this is just something to do with having a log symplectic form, then there's this nice symmetry of the graded, Hodge graded pieces. And this is a fairly standard thing to prove. It's not super difficult. So we have this relationship. If you think about the Hodge graded pieces as sort of decomposing and being arranged into a Hodge diamond, this gives you a symmetry of that Hodge diamond. Um, and as a consequence of these two propositions, we get the following thing. We get this uh, curious hard left shift condition appearing on the cohomology of any log symplectic pair. So the curious hard left shift condition says that there's some beta, so some class beta in the fourth weight graded piece of H2, such that if I take the cut product with this beta to the D minus nth power, this will give me a map from, well, any cohomology here, and it's going to raise degree by 2d minus m, so that'll bring us up here. And it'll raise weight by 4d minus uh, 4m, so that'll give us this relationship here. And so we say a pair has a curious hard left shuts condition. So, so, so xd has the curious hard left shuts condition if these are all, these are our isomorphisms for all l and m. And so as a consequence of these two propositions, so this proposition here and this proposition here, you get that if I have a pure weight two log symplectic pair, then the cohomology ring 
has the curious hard lash at its property. Okay, right. So that's um, so maybe I should ask. I, I didn't ask before. How how when am I supposed to stop? Well, usually on the hour. On the hour. Okay, great. No, but if you stop a few minutes early, we'll, we'll have more time for questions. But we can run questions late. That's okay. I, I just wanted to make sure I um, I, I didn't go over. Um, yeah. So I'll well we'll be going to the hour then. Uh, okay. Great. So this is the um, right. So that's the curious hard left property. And in fact, I should mention that you can also extend all of the results from the previous page here. So all of these results can be applied to type three degenerations of hypercalar varieties as well. So the result that I was talking about, this is essentially just a formal statement about very uh, certain rings with, with various properties. So you know, graded rings whose, mixed hot, whose, whose graded pieces carry mixed hot structures and with specific elements. So this is all just a formal statement. So all of the results that I've mentioned can be extended to results about degenerations. So I'll say this in a fairly quick way. So to any degeneration, there is a limit mix Hodge structure. So the underlying rational vector space is isomorphic to, at least, the cohomology of a smooth fiber. And the weight filtration is given by the monodromy action. And since I just asked for a degeneration, not anything semi-stable or things like that, this monodromy action has to be given by the a uh, unipotent part of monodromy. And then the Hodge filtration is given by the limit in some sense of the Hodge filtrations. On the smooth fibers. And so these of course come with Hodge filtrations. So if you take the limit as it moves towards the fiber over zero, you get this limiting Hodge filtration. Okay, so if I take the results that I mentioned on the previous page, what we get is the following thing, is that for any good type three degeneration of hypercalar varieties, the ring, which is composed of, and I'll denote this way, so I'll use H uh, star X infinity to denote this mixed Hodge structure. So if I take H, the, the, I, take the, I take a limit, mix, I take a degeneration, and then I take the limit mix hot structures on all the cohomology groups associated to this. Oops. Then um, this thing will have the structure of a ring given a cup product. And in fact, this has the curious hard Lashitz property as well. So you can prove an analogous result for type three degenerations. And I'm just gonna maybe make a men um, mention at the end of all of this that there are, I don't know about analogous, but there are similar types of results for uh, pure weight one and type two degenerations. So there are similar. So I, I just went over the case of pure weight two and type three, but there are similar uh, results hold for pure weight one and type two degenerations. Maybe I said that. Okay, great. So this is, this, is, this is all of this. This is sort of the um, formal Hodge theoretic statements. But then you can also ask, where does this curious hard Leschet's property come from? Um, so this comes essentially from non-abelian Hodge theory, and it comes from the following setup. This is first uh, noticed by Hausel and Fernandez Rodriguez Viegas. And so they start, I mean, they're looking at the non-abelian Hodge correspondence, which relates to the following data. So you have a curve, maybe with some punctures, and you have a group G, maybe an algebraic group. And then you can construct two different spaces. You can construct the Betty moduli space. So this is the moduli of uh, G local systems. And you can construct the moduli space of G, G Higgs bundles. And you can think about how 
these, these things are going to be related. So non-abelian Hodge theory tells you that this is, there's going to be a diffeomorphism between these two spaces. They're not deformation equivalent as, as algebraic spaces, but there's a diffe diffeomorphism. Um, and you can start to compare the cohomology of the, spa the two spaces under this, this uh, identification. So one thing that you have on the space of Higgs bundles is the Hitchin vibration. And associated to the Hitchin vibration is the corresponding perverse Lorray filtration. So maybe I'll call this H. And you can ask, what is, I mean, what does this perverse Lorray filtration correspond to on the Betty moduli space? So the answer or the proposed answer given by um, Di Cataldo, Hauso, and Emiliarini is that this perverse Lorray filtration corresponds to the doubled weight filtration on the cohomology of the Betty moduli space. And if, if you take this for granted, then the relative hard left shets uh, property. So if I take a relatively ample bundle with respect to this map H, this gives you a nice, uh, so there's a question. Um, can, can you read it, Andrew? Yeah, so, so someone says, sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Is the corollary to the, uh, on CHL applicable to the setup of good semi-stable degeneration? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, there's a CHL property for good semi-stable degenerations of type three. I, I think that's the answer. I hope that's the answer. Oh, that's the reply. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I have this, this, this relative hard left shets and what this corresponds to is the, um, is the curious hard left shets condition that I described before. Okay, great, so. Uh, the question that you can then ask is, I have curious hard left shuts for these two different types of things. I have curious hard left shuts for good degenerations of epicular varieties in type three. And for log symplectic pairs, of pure weight uh, two. So you can ask, is there a corresponding P equal W type relation? So to what extent does this relation here arise from something related to all of this? Now, of course, we don't really expect that there's any relationship in general to non-abelian Hodge theory, but you can still ask, is there some interpretation of this as a relative hard left shuts condition on a diffeomorphic space. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna talk about several different results in the maybe remaining five minutes that suggest this. Um, so first is a result with, um, with myself and uh, Jean Li, Junyang Shen and Kui Zheng Yin. So I should point out that this is largely based on separate work of the final two authors. And this says that if I have a hypercalar variety and I have a whole morphic uh, Lagrangian torus vibration. So this is analogous to the Hitchin system. Then what I can do is I can construct a degeneration of hypercalar varieties. This is not necessarily a good degeneration, it's just, just a degeneration. And a diffeomorphism between Y and a smooth fiber of this degeneration of hypercalar varieties, so that the perverse Lorray filtration of this map F on H of Y is equal to the doubled weight filtration on the cohomology of XT, so a smooth fiber. So you can prove that this relationship holds essentially for hypercalar varieties, assuming that you start with the homomorphic Lagrangian torus vibration. 
to make this a completely, you know, complete picture, what you need to do is you need to show that given such a degeneration, there's a corresponding Lagrangian torus vibration. And so the converse of this doesn't necessarily, well, it's not known to always hold. So it's not known that if I have a type three degeneration, and in fact, this is a type three degeneration. Uh, is there a corresponding Lagrangian torus vibration on a diffeomorphic variety or deformation equivalent? So can I, can I go the other way? So that's not known, but it is known for K3 surfaces. So this is actually sort of this nice equivalence for K3 surfaces. Okay. Um, now you can once, so we've sort of at least mostly settled the question for you know, module of this extra bit for hypercalar varieties. There is this P equals W type relation that um, tells us that a curious hard left shuts condition should hold. So you can then ask for box symplectic pairs of pure weight, what happens? So there, as far as I, I know, there, I don't know too many examples of these log symplectic pairs of pure weight. This has bugged me for a long time that I don't know how to construct more. Um, you know, a large part of this is the fact that I'm restricting myself to a simple normal crossings boundary, and that's, that's going to obstruct me quite a bit. Um, but as far as I know, there are only a couple of classes of these things. So first is a, um, so log uh, Glabiao surfaces with a nodal boundary. And the second class of log symplectic pairs are these uh, toric cluster varieties. So you can ask whether there's a P, whether there's a P equals W type relationship in these cases. And so in the first case, this is something that can be done. So this is done by myself in a paper from maybe a year or so ago. And then the parts of this are done by, uh, in a paper of Zili Zhang. Um, so I, I, I wanna give him a bit of credit as well. So uh, first is that given any log, log Calabia surface, you can build a Lagrangian torus vibration on this. And then you can show that the perverse Lorey filtration on S minus D satisfies this relationship. So to of S minus D. And then finally, what you can do is you can show that there's a complex structure on uh, S minus D for which F is holomorphic. And so you fill in most of the details in this uh, non abelian Hodge theory package, though you fill them in in a slightly different way. You build the fibration, uh, you identify uh, the filtrations, and then you can show that there's this is actually going to be complex, uh, have a complex structure. But I'm not saying anything about this being obtained via some hypercalar rotation. In fact, I should also notice that in my work, um, the perverse Lorey filtration is in fact just a Lorey filtration. And so the last thing that I wanted to talk about is stuff that I'm sort of planning to do, but. Uh, the idea is basically that you can prove a similar result for toric cluster varieties. Um, without going into too much detail, uh, this is basically built because these toric cluster varieties can be built out of very simple uh, log Calabia surfaces by taking products and quotients, and then all the corresponding data can be glued together. So that's sort of work in progress, um, which I didn't, I guess, get to mention too much. Um, yeah, so that's it for me today. And that's all I have to say. Um, thank you for listening. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew. Let's um, thank the speaker. Um, well, we're officially uh, out of time, but we're not. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, um, I'm going to ask. So, Andrew, um, mm. two questions. Well, first, uh, you know, what goes in those last two little blanks on the bottom of the page? Um, <laughs> but the second uh -huh. question is, which might be related to this, um, is do you have examples that you know don't come from surfaces? 
Yeah, so the fake and Odesky example, I that, know- That's the one? That's the yeah. one? Okay. Um, it, it doesn't come from a surface in an obvious way. Um, as I mentioned, there's like this game you can play by blowing up symplectic leaves and blowing down symplectic leaves. So there's, there's you know, certainly a possibility that you can construct it by taking products of surfaces and moving around symplectic leaves and stuff like that. Um, but this is sort of related to the question of how does one classify log symplectic pairs? Um, there's you know, known birational modifications of such things. So the question is, is there like a finite number of log symplectic pairs by, that you can sort of obtain everything from by taking products and blow ups and blow downs? Um, so I don't have any intuition on that problem, but I do know that this vague and Odesky example can't be obtained as a product of services. Right. right. So in that case, um, the first part, which was the oh. varieties. Did you want to say anything else about the um, the basic surface or the picture in that case? Oh, I mean, this. I, I was planning just to like sketch how to prove uh, the P equals W type relation for um, the toric cluster varieties. Uh, I mean, I think it would take me a, a a little while to actually do it, but you know, I, I gave you know my basic description. Sure. You know. You take a specific surface, you build these toric cluster varieties, you know, as a by covering them by quotients of, of nice surfaces, the quotients of products of nice surfaces, and then you sort of build up from there using this, um, not using this theorem, using just parts of this theorem of, of, of myself and see. Great. Maybe I should say separate results here. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, let's uh, thank Andrew. Uh, may I? Oh, you have one? Of okay, course, very yeah. good. Yeah. Um, could you go back to, well, several slides before? Oh, well, I don't know no, this one, just the, um, the, the uh, next one. Next one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if this is a comment or question, but uh, um, so, so about this converse direction. Mm -hmm. So um, in uh, in our work of, with uh, Oshima, mm -hmm. uh, so we we proved something which may not be related or may, may be related. So what we proved is that uh, if you have a hypercular uh, degeneration type three, mm -hmm. then you have some homorom uh, you have some uh, homomorphic Lagrangian torus vibration. Oh, okay. Sorry, maybe yeah. I'm sorry. And, I, I didn't know that was the proved. relation is not this p equal w type. Okay. So we related by a hypercular rotation. Okay. So it's certainly diffeomorphic, mm -hmm. but the same end is slightly different. But yeah, so the kind of variant, but. Uh, okay, so maybe I shouldn't say not known then. I'm sorry about that. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, precisely speaking, uh, we needed a K3 type condition or generalized Kumba. I see. N um, not, not for general, a priori. OK. So yeah. we, we basically used the modular, I mean, the modular structure for the proof. OK. Yeah. OK. I mean, that's great. Um, yeah, I've been meaning to look at this paper for a long time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I'm not sure if this is really the compass, but we haven't checked, but uh, okay. that may be related. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I've, as I said, I, I should have looked at this long ago. So. Thank you. The, the okay. morphism between y and xt, you said it is not realized as a, a trivialization of some twister space, so they are not related by hypercalar rotation in general? I mean, I think that's sort of the idea, but the way that we've done this is, is not necessarily uh, in that way, no. Yeah, it, it's sort of the idea is that you basically can, um, this is all done by looking at operators on the cohomology of hypercalar varieties. I don't know if you're if you're familiar with um, the the work of Shen and Yin, um, then that's sort of their their main thing. Um, just sort of looking at how you know the standard uh, standard actions of, of uh, S O N uh, algebras act on um, cohomology of hypercalar varieties. Um, 
so so it's mostly just you know working through that. I mean, the paper that proves this is very short. It's it's really mostly just applying Shannonian. So you work cohomologically and then by some period domain argument yeah. that why will exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's just something about the cohomology and something about the moduli theory of hypercalar varieties. I see, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, in that case, let's uh, thank Andrew again. Thanks again for having me. I appreciate it.